<laughs> Ashley, if you wouldn't mind uh, kicking us off. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Ashley Westlock. Um, I am the president of the Eastern Michigan chapter of Fighting, um, oh my, Foundation Finding, Fighting Blindness. Uh, I, I'm not very good at being put on the spot to talk about myself, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself anyways. Um, I am a ophthalmic technician. I work in ophthalmology. I primarily work with patients who have um, wet and dry macular degeneration. Um, and how I got involved in foundation fighting blindness is just kind of a whim. Um, I was just looking for, you know, something to give, you know, to volunteer my time in and, you know, something that I feel passionate about, which is, you know, being able to help people see um, and just being a part of the cause. So um, that's just what led me here. Um, so far, I've been in, participated in like the, um, oh, I'm trying to think of the um, Eye of the Beholder art show. I have a few pieces in there. Um, I also was involved a little bit with the Vision Walk um, for, you know, this year in 2021. And um, I started learning a little bit more about the organization and decided that I want to, you know, really make myself a part of it versus just, you know, doing the vision walk, which is a wonderful cause anyway. So um, I'm going to introduce the next person um, that's going to be our vice uh, president, uh, DeAndrea Valverde. Hi, everyone. I'm DeAndrea. I'm the vice president of the Michigan East Chapter Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, I got into this, my daughter has the rare genetic um, impairment of Stargardt's disease. Um, it's, it's inherited and she's been struggling with this obviously since she was little, little, little. We didn't get her diagnosis until two years ago, which as a parent and I'm for my daughter as well, it was a very frustrating um, leading up to that because essentially when we would go to the eye doctors, they would just tell me that her eyes are perfect, that, you know, she's little girl, she wants glasses as a fashion piece and she's lying. So leading up to her whole diagnosis was just frustrating to say the least. Um, but we have it now. And now I just want to be a voice for my daughter, um, get more involved. You know, we've done the vision walk for two years. So, um, Oh my gosh, it was all, you know, online and I'm excited that we get to actually be in person this year, hopefully. Um, so yeah, I just want to be a voice for her, find a care for everything. Um, just fight for my daughter and fight for everybody else that has a vision impairment. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, both Ashley and DeAndrea, um, for those welcoming remarks. And I am going to go ahead and share my screen. What I'm going to be presenting on for just a, um, five to 10 minutes is um, some foundation updates. So one moment. All right. Let's see. Slideshow. And there we go. So the Foundation Fighting Blindness, first of all, my name is Ali Sarwick. I'm the Midwest Chapter Engagement Manager. Um, and I want to start with uh, our track record. And the, we are the world's leading organization committed to finding treatments and cures for retinal diseases. Uh, so far, 856 million has been raised to support and advance research that will reverse blindness and restore vision since our inception in 1971. So this is our 50th year anniversary. Last year, the foundation received 82 grants. This includes over 90 investigators and 67 institutions. Going off of that, the foundation has funded studies at hundreds of prominent institutions throughout the world, 
Uh, these include, to be specific, Wilmer Eye Institute, John Hopkins University School of Medicine. I apologize if you can hear my dogs eating. Um, Institut de la Vision France in Paris, France. Morrisfield Eye Hospital, University College London. Shea Eye Institute, University of Pennsylvania. So let's look into the inherited retinal disease landscape. So uh, over 200,000 people in the US have a rare inherited retinal disease, which as many of you know, is also known as IRDs. This number increases to over 4.5 million globally. Then we can move on to the, the next circle on this slide is um, 10 million people in the US are affected with age-related macular degeneration and 150 million globally. Currently, 45 clinical trials are either underway or being prepared and um, for launching new potential treatments. So the next slide, inher identifying inherited retinal diseases. Funding has been a driving force behind the, the progress towards cures, including the identification of more than 270 genes <clears throat> linked to retinal disease. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, and the launch of 45 clinical trials that are either started or underway. And so these identified genes include RP, Stargardt disease, LCA, um, Usher syndrome, and sorry, I did not mean to do that. I can't see the last slide, and other <laughs> retinal diseases. So this next slide has a lot going on, but that's, I always say that's how great to say that because it's all about our signature programs and initiatives. So our, we have over 40 volunteer led chapters. Um, these dedicated volunteers, uh, you just heard from two, we're gonna be hearing from more today. Uh, raise funds, increase public awareness, and provide support to families affected by retinal diseases in their communities. The clinical consortium includes over 20 clinical centers of excellence with, with experience in IRDs and with standardized assessment protocols. The RD fund, which was la launched a few years ago, um, this retinal disease venture philanthropy fund drives emerges emerging therapies that are moving towards or in clinical trials. My retina tracker, this is, and I really hope everyone um, is aware of this one, um, is it's a global, free, secure, easy to use uh, patient controlled patient registry. And we have over uh, 10,000 profiles and it's just really to get that genetic testing done and um, just hopefully find some answers. Grants and awards. Uh, this supports clinical studies and preclinical research applicable to a broad range of retinal degenerative diseases. Biobonds are advocacy opportunities for advancing new loans, uh, new studies, excuse me, um, which includes loans for Biomedical Research Act. Visions um, it actually are. I'm trying to think of the exact date, it's in June. Hopefully you've received the invite. This is a uh, very, very um, two day led event, which with a huge panel of um, uh, educators, but we provide a supportive learning environment through conferences, seminars, and, and workshops. It's basically a very in-depth speaker series like the one today. Dinner, galas, and event. Um, so we have a variety of custom and unique events in cities across the nation to raise awareness and research funding. Um, this includes our Raising Our Sites campaign, which um, Ashley mentioned the Eye of the Beholder. Um, you'll be hearing from Sue about um, a bowling outing, but really it's just any DIY event that will help uh, for the, the mission of the foundation by providing funding, fundraising. Lastly, uh, Vision Walk events. We currently have over 35, which has raised more than 58 million since we started them. And the first one was in spring 2008. So uh, as there was so much that we're doing, there's so much ways to get involved. Um, so 
If you would like to do that, we are open to new innovative ideas to expand our reach. But the main thing is thank you for joining, um, joining us today. And if anything, whether you have questions or you'd like to get more involved, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is asaric at fightingblindness.org, but a lot easier one to remember is uh, chapters at fightingblindness.org. So um, I am gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and then hand things over to Luke. Thank you, Allie. So yeah, my name is Luke. I am the education chair for the Michigan chapter. Um, I'm a graduate student at Oakland University and I'm studying biology. And I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Abigail Fahim and read a little bit about her background. So thank you to Dr. Fahim for, for coming today. D Dr. Fahim is a clinician scientist um, and, an, and an ophthalmologist who has devoted herself to the care of patients with inherited retinal degenerations, uh, to understanding their diseases at the cellular and molecular level, and to developing new therapies is largely untreatable. First, as an undergraduate biology and graduated summa cum laude in the medical scientist training program at the University of Michigan, she completed her PhD in the Department of Human Genetics and later transferred to Baylor College of Medicine where she completed medical school. During her ophthalmology rotations, she developed an interest in the genetics of retinal degeneration and subsequently completed a one-year postdoctoral fellowship with Dr. Stephen Diger at the University of Texas, investigating the contribution of genetic modifiers to phenotypic variation in retinitis pigmentosa. She trained in ophthalmology at the University of Michigan, where she has remained completing fellowships in inherited retinal disease and medical retina. She joined the faculty in 2018 and has a practice caring for patients with inherited retinal diseases. She participates in numerous clinical trials and is also supported by a National Eye Institute KOA grant to establish a research program. During the fellowship, she developed an interest in the power of stem cell derived RPE and photoreceptors to develop models of genetic disease for investigating disease mechanisms and testing new therapeutics. She currently uses these tools to investigate the RPE choroid interface and the relationship between these two issues and in inherited retinal degeneration. And she's gonna to talk to us today about new research in stem cells um, and how they can be used to treat uh, inherited retinal diseases. So thank you so much for coming, Dr. Fahim. You're welcome. And thank you for that, uh, for that introduction. I'm gonna share my screen now. Thanks so much everyone for, for joining. Okay, good. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm at, as he said, I'm at the Kellogg Eye Center and uh, I see these patients with inherited retinal diseases. And um, I have a research program investigating dysfunction of these retinal pigment epithelial cells or RPE cells in inherited retinal diseases, including choroideremia. Um, we have a few projects going on in the lab, um, but primarily choroideremia right now. Um, so I'm happy to have this opportunity to share our work and I'm gonna give you an overview of what we've been doing in my lab to try to understand this disease better so we can work towards a treatment. And also just to give you a broader idea of the type of work that's done with stem cells and how they can be used to model inherited retinal diseases in the lab in addition to the potential um, therapeutic applications of, of stem cells. So um, we'll sort of touch on a couple of different things. So first to talk about my work more specifically, choroideremia is an X-linked recessive chorioretinal dystrophy. And it involves degeneration of three tissues, the retina and the choroid, which is the blood supply for the retina, and then the retinal pigment epithelium or RPE cells, which is a supportive layer of cells that sits between the retina and the choroid um, blood supply. 
And in particular, the very early and dramatic loss of the choroid is what sets choroideremia apart from many of the other inherited retinal diseases. And the onset is in childhood or adolescence with um, often with legal blindness in early adulthood. So to further make this point, I want to present this clinical contrast between choroideremia and some other inherited retinal diseases that raises some good questions about the choroid and retinal disease. So here we have two patients with retinitis pigmentosa, which is the most common inherited retinal disease that we see. And they both have mutations in uh, the H2A gene. And the top patient has more moderate RP and the bottom patient has more advanced RP. Um, the advanced patient is legally blind and has choroidal atrophy. So I'm gonna show that to you. So this is an OCT picture, which is a cross section of the retina and the LACI network under the retina is a network of blood vessels called the choroid. And it's about the same thickness as the retina in this top image, which is normal. And in the bottom image, it's quite thin. And so the bottom image, the advanced patient has choroidal atrophy. And that's because choroidal atrophy like this is quite common in advanced RP after there's been extensive damage to the retina. And that choroidal atrophy is likely either due to inflammation that gets incited by retina cell death or loss of growth factors from the retina tissue or some combination of, of those, those factors. Now this is choroideremia and this also has choroidal atrophy, but it's different. So you can see on the OCT picture that the choroid is relatively thick in the center, but as you go out towards the edges, it completely disappears more so than in the previous slide. And so this thick part in the center corresponds to this orange, dark orange area where there's still preservation of the choroid. But then in these areas where the choroid completely disappears, that corresponds to these white areas um, where there's complete lack of pigment due to loss of the pigmented cells in the choroid and in the retinal pigment epithelium. Um, so when this disease was first described, they called it choroideremia because the most striking feature when you look at the retina is that the choroid is gone. Uh, but interestingly, most people in the field today suspect that the primary problem actually starts in the retinal pigment epithelial cells um, that I mentioned, the RPE cells. And it's the RPE dysfunction that ultimately leads to photoreceptor and choroidal death. And so this leads us to ask, how does RPE dysfunction in choroideremia lead to death of the choroid and the photoreceptors? So the RPE is uniquely positioned to impact both the photoreceptors and the choroid. This is intuitive because the RPE sits between these other two tissues, which line the back of the inside of your eye. And this figure shows us the layer of RPE cells sandwiched between the photoreceptors on this side and the choroid on this side. So in this figure, the front of the eye is towards the bottom of the page and the back of the eye is towards the top. And this is a zoomed in diagram of what's lining the back of the inside of your eye. So the photoreceptors, of course, are the light sensing cells, the rods and the cones that sense the, the image, the light, and send the image to your brain. And they have all these little processes called, called outer segments that intercalate with processes from the RPE cells. And the RPE cells have a very close relationship with the photoreceptors. And we know a lot about that relationship. The RPE supports the photoreceptors in numerous ways, including secretion of growth factors. Um, they go through a process called phagocytosis, where the RPE cells eat and digest old used up fragments of outer segments that the photoreceptors don't need anymore. And the RPE cells also partner with the photoreceptors to carry out the visual cycle, which is a series of biochemical reactions that allows your eye to sense light. Um, and there are more functions as well, but we know far less about the relationship between the RPE and the choroid. Um, how do RPE cells support the choroidal blood vessels or do they support the choroid? We know that the choroid supplies nutrients and takes away waste. So the choroid is clearly important for the health of the RPE and the photoreceptors, but is the inverse true? Are RPE cells important for survival of the choroidal blood vessels? Or to put it another way, can RPE dysfunction cause choroidal death? So there have been a few reports of findings in donated eyes from um, affected patients with choroideremia. And what they have found is that there are widespread irregularities in the thickness and pigmentation of the RPE cells, even in areas of normal photoreceptors. 
So in this image on the right, you can see how lumpy bumpy these RPE cells are. And there are some areas that are thick and some areas that are thin. Um, and you, when you compare this to this age-matched control um, without disease, this person has a nice normal even layer of uniformly sized RPE cells. So this suggests that the RPE cells are primarily affected in choroideremia, meaning the choroideremia mutation leads to disease in the RPE cells specifically, which then go on to impact the photoreceptors in the choroidal blood vessels. So we know the gene mutated in choroideremia. It's called CHM, and this gene encodes for a protein called REP1 or RAB escort protein 1. And REP is shown in this diagram by this large purple shape. And its job is to attach fatty chains called prenyl groups to RAB proteins. So the fatty prenyl groups are these black squiggles and RAB proteins are these blue ovals. So RABs are these small proteins that direct traffic in the cells. One of the primary ways that proteins get transportation to different areas of the cell is by hitching a ride in these vesicles made up of lipids or small fat molecules. And so these fatty bubbles carry around proteins to different parts of the cell, including the surface of the cell to be secreted to the outside of the cell. So you can think of these vesicles as the bus system of the cell, and then the RAB proteins would be like the bus drivers because they tell the vesicles where to go. And so the RAB proteins attach to these vesicles by having these fatty prenyl side chains that insert into the lipid vesicle. And the REP protein in purple is required in order to put those prenyl side chains onto the RAB proteins. So without REP, the bus drivers essentially can't find the buses. And so what I've tried to show you so far is that number one, choroideremia has an early and dramatic loss of the choroidal blood vessels that we can't yet explain. Number two, the problem is likely to start in the retinal pigment epithelial cells that sit right next to the choroid. And number three, the genetic defect in choroideremia is likely to lead to errors in directing traffic of proteins. So the question is, what could the RPE cells be doing or not doing in terms of protein traffic that could be damaging the choroid? And so we think it has to do with polarized protein secretion because we know that RPE cells are prolific secretors of growth factors in a polarized or directional fashion, meaning that some proteins are secreted much more towards the apical surface, which faces the photoreceptors, and some are secreted much more towards the basolateral surface, which faces the choroid. So as an example, RPE cells secrete PEDF, which inhibits blood vessel formation towards the photoreceptors, and VEGF, which promotes blood vessel formation towards the choroid. So there are these two growth factors that have opposite effects and are secreted in opposite directions. So you can imagine that upsetting this balance of polarized growth factor secretion could really have a big impact on how the RPE cells are able to support or potentially damage the surrounding tissues. So our hypothesis is that there's altered directional protein secretion such that the balance of growth factors and inhibitory factors secreted towards the choroid is skewed towards inhibition and causes choroidal death. So um, to answer this question, we do use stem cells. The field of regenerative medicine has been growing a lot and we can now use induced pluripotent stem cells in which blood cells or fibroblasts are reprogrammed by expression of different transcription factors to induce a pluripotent state, meaning that they now have the potential to become any cell type in the body and we can direct different differentiation programs to generate different cell types. And in particular, in the field of retina, which has really led the way um, in regenerative medicine, we can generate retinal organoids, shown on the left, um, that recapitulate human development very well in the various cell lines of the retina, including photoreceptors. And this blue arrow, which is a little hard to see, but you can see the beginnings of photoreceptor outer segments, and this is a retinal organoid that's been cultured for four months. Um, and we can also generate uh, excellent retinal pigment epithelial cells. So um, to study RPE dysfunction in choroideremia, we use RPE differentiation from induced pluripotent stem cells. And the line that we're using is derived from adult skin fibroblasts. And by about day 40 into the differentiation program, we start to see islands of pigmented RPE. RPE cells have this brown pigment. 
And then we pick those islands over the next month or two as they mature. And we do that at a microscope in a, in a, in a hood um, to keep things sterile. And we use a tiny needle and then we plate the cells onto plastic and this is what they look like and, and they mature um, for a few weeks. And then we plate them onto these permeable membranes that are suspended in media. And that allows us to separate the apical side from the basal lateral side. So we can look at those um, two chambers separately. To make choroideremia RPE, we use CRISPR gene editing technology. And um, I'm sure many of you have heard of CRISPR. It's been in the media a lot. And it's sometimes described as genetic scissors because it's a method of editing specific genes. So we used CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out the CHM gene in a stem cell line. And then we use the original line as the control. So the two lines are genetically identical except for the CHM gene mutation. Um, and this over here is called a Western blot and we're using it to detect Rep1 protein represented by this band. And this is the knockout cell lines which has no Rep1 protein. And this is the control line which has the Rep1 protein and then this is another type of RPE cell line, which also has the REP1 protein, just showing that we successfully deleted REP1 from the, the knockout cell line. Um, oh, and, and just to say that, that we've now made RPE from these, um, from these stem cells, and we're looking at secreted apical and basolateral proteins and how they're different in the choroideremia RPE and the normal control RPE. And the goal of this work is to understand how the RPE may be negatively impacting the choroid and the photoreceptors. Um, and, and that work is ongoing. Um, but I'd like to talk about some of the other potential applications of stem cells for inherited retinal diseases as well. Um, my work thus far has focused on using stem cell derived RPE uh, to model choroideremia and other diseases, but we can also make photoreceptors um, from stem cells. Um, and this slide is um, showing retinal organoids, um, which are these tiny retinas growing in a dish. And here in this video, we're isolating these organoids with a needle under the microscope. And they differentiate and develop along a timeline that's remarkably similar to human fetal development of the retina. Um, so it takes at least four months to start seeing rudimentary photoreceptors with outer segments and at least six months to see more developed outer segments. And stem cell derived eye tissues, including both photoreceptors and RPE cells can be used either for disease modeling, which is what I um, have been describing so far or regenerative therapies. Um, and so for disease modeling, like what I showed you, we grow cells that have the disease of interest to understand the disease better and to develop new treatments. And then regenerative uses of stem cells would be using the stem cells to grow healthy photoreceptors or RPE that would be suitable for transplantation into a patient to replace cells that have been lost from retinal degeneration, whether that's due to choroideremia or retinitis pigmentosa or macular degeneration, or really any disease that results in retina cell death. So I wanted to show you this really cool example. This is um, a disease, this is an example of disease modeling using retinal organoids. So on the left, we see um, photos of a patient with an inherited retinal disease called retinoschisis. And in this disease, there's a mutation in a gene called retinoschisin. Um, and this is a protein in the retina that holds the retina cells together. So it's really important for cell cell adhesions. So when this protein is defective, you get a separation of the layers of the retina. And this is an, these are OCT images, cross sections of the retina. And you see all these black spaces where the retinal layers have been separated from each other. And so these authors made retinal organoids with a retinoschisis mutation. And look at all of these spaces that have formed within the retinal organoid. It really closely mimics what we see on the OCT. So it's just really a remarkable example um, where immediately the, the phenotype was obvious, uh, which is not always gonna be the case, but it, it was in this case. And in terms of the therapeutic potential of stem cell derived photoreceptors, um, this is a publication from this year from our Kellogg uh, visiting professor, Robin Ali, who's at King's College London. And he just published this paper a few months ago in Cell Reports. And for a while now, Robin Ali and others have demonstrated differentiation of human photoreceptors from pluripotent stem cells. 
And this paper really shows that transplantation of stem cell derived cone photoreceptors into a mouse with retinal degeneration leads to integration of transplanted cells with evidence of synaptic connections and then evidence in the mice of improved visual behavior. And so it really took it all the way through, um, which is really you know, the first time that, that we've seen improved visual behavior in an animal model from these transplanted um, stem cell derived cones. And so we've really come a long way in terms of having a strong preclinical rationale for trials in human patients. Um, and we're all waiting to see when we'll have a phase one trial with this type of technology. And there, there have been, I should mention, there have been some um, phase one slash two studies for stem cell derived RPE transplant. So in that previous slide with the mice, I was talking about stem cell derived cones, um, but there have been trials with stem cell derived RPE in human patients. Um, and this, what I'm showing you here is from one of the first trials, a paper was published in 2015. They had nine patients with macular degeneration and nine patients with Stargardt disease. Um, these studies were sponsored by Advanced Cell Technology, which I think is now known as Astellas. Um, but these were safety studies, and there were a few complications. Four subjects had cataract, which um, cataract is extremely common after any kind of, of, of retina surgery, so that's not surprising uh, at all. Um, one patient had a, an infection, uh, infectious endophthalmitis, and then one had a sterile vitritis, which means like a, an inflammation that's not from infection. Um, and you can see these in these photos, these areas of pigmentation. The white area is the, the atrophic area where tissue has been lost. And so that's that this patient's going to have like a large blind spot in that area. But then this black circle is just showing you where they transplanted the cells, kind of at the edge of the atrophic area. And you can see it increases in pigmentation over time, which I mean, you could argue, is that, is that supposed to be a good thing or a bad thing? It, I'm not really sure. It, you know, RPE cells are pigmented. I think this is showing that the RPE cells are pigmenting over time after they're transplanted. Um, and, and you also see increased thickness over time on the OCT images, which again, you could say, well, is that good or bad? You know, is it forming scar tissue or why is it increasing in thickness? You know, at, at, at this point, this is, a, this is a very early phase study. So they're just trying to look at safety and follow the patients and see what happens. Um, patients did have uh, an improvement in visual acuity reading the eye chart. So these graphs are showing the change over time and how many letters on the eye chart were read by the patient. So the top graph is the macular degeneration patients, and then the bottom graph is the Stargardt patients. So the red line shows um, the treated eyes, and the blue line shows the untreated eyes, and the green line shows the difference. And so essentially just what they're showing is that over time, um, there was an improvement in the treated eye compared to the untreated eye. And this was significant in the macular degeneration patients. Uh, but did not reach significance in the Stargardt patients. Of course, it's a, it's a very small number of patients. Um, and, and I think it's important to mention that in these sorts of trials that are replacing RPE cells only in areas of geographic atrophy, where there's loss of both photoreceptors and RPE, you wouldn't really necessarily expect to have an improvement in visual acuity if you're not replacing the photoreceptors. Um, because you'd really have to replace both types of cells to get a, a meaningful improvement in vision. But the rationale behind transplanting RPE alone is to target the margin of the atrophic zone. So basically what they did right at the, the interface between the disease tissue and the normal tissue is where they're transplanting the cells because this is an area where there are photoreceptors that are, that are sick and missing RPE, but they're, not, they're still there. <laughs> And so you're trying to salvage that area to prevent um, progression of that atrophic zone, basically, to halt or slow progression. So that's, that's the rationale behind that type of um, treatment or trial. So there's also an upcoming phase one slash two stem cell RPE trial um, using RPE from our colleagues, Sally Temple and Jeff Stern, who are at the Neural Stem Cell Institute in New York. Um, and they are collaborating faculty at Kellogg. And they use what's called adult human stem cell derived RPE. So 
um, just to kind of explain what that means. Sally and Jeff have focused their work on endogenous stem cells in human RPE. So, so far we've talked about making RPE cells or photoreceptor cells from induced pluripotent stem cells, which are stem cells that we've generated by reprogramming adult skin cells or blood cells. And then we turn them into stem cells and then we turn them into RPE. But it turns out there are stem cells that are in our eye already that live among our RPE cells. So a subpopulation of adult RPE cells in my eye or, or anyone's eye, about five to 10% have the ability to proliferate and generate new RPE cells. So they're a type of stem cell that's already kind of living in our eye. So um, these have now been used to generate clinical grade RPE for transplantation for a trial in macular degeneration patients. And this paper here is showing the improvement in spatial frequency, which is one way of measuring vision in a type of rat that has a retinal degeneration. So they injected these RPE cells under the retina in this rat and the injected eyes had improved uh, vision. So that's the preclinical rationale for this, this trial, which has not started yet, um, but is, is being planned. So I should also mention the retinal progenitor cell clinical trials. Um, there are two companies doing that, JSite and Reneuron. Um, so this, it's, it's, it's a, you know, a different type of technology, um, but also a cell-based therapy. These are retinal precursor cells that are in the process of taking on a photoreceptor cell fate, um, but they're still very immature. And this type of cell can be derived from stem cells in the lab, um, but these particular retinal progenitor cells that are currently being used in clinical trial are fetally derived. Um, one company, Reneuron, is injecting them subretinally um, in RP patients with a hope to replace lost cells, while the other company, JSite, is injecting them intravitreally, which is shown in this picture where they're just being injected into the vitreous cavity. Um, and this would not replace lost cells because it's not being injected into the right location to replace cells. But the rationale is that these, these very immature cells may be releasing uh, neurotrophic factors or growth factors, uh, as they say in their statement from their website. And this may improve the survival of the patient's own retina cells. So that's the goal of, of that. Um, and Reneuron, which is the company with the subretinal injection has reported some phase one slash two data uh, which is shown here, they had 22 patients. Uh, two of them had serious adverse events leading to vision loss. Um, the table excluded those two patients and they showed that in the remaining 20 patients, there was an improvement in visual acuity in the treated eye. Um, of note, the untreated eyes also had improvements in vision, um, but not quite as much. Uh, but I think it's a little hard to draw conclusions yet, yet at this point, um, but you know, could, be, could be somewhat promising. So the approaches um, that are in various stages, just to summarize the approaches that are in various stages of preclinical and clinical development include RPE cells that are either from allogenic stem cells, um, uh, meaning not, not the patient's own cells, and that's what has been tried thus far in clinical trial, versus autologous using a patient's own cells to make RPE, um, which is being planned at the National Eye Institute, I believe versus adult RPE stem cells, which is being planned, um, which is, which is the, the one I talked about with um, Sally Temple and Jeff Stern's work. Um, and then photoreceptor strategies include the current retinal progenitor cell trials that I just discussed, or stem cell derived rods and cones, which is what I showed you in that paper with the mice that have improved visual behavior. Um, and then there's this other technology I didn't touch on um, there are some endogenous stem cells that are present in the ciliary body, uh, which is another, it's a part of, part of the eye uh, sort of next to the retina. And some people, um, there's some preclinical research in, in that area to see whether you know, the, those could be um, used at all. And then there's some preclinical research in scaffold-based co-cultures of RPE and photoreceptors, um, and sometimes choroidal blood vessels as well. So remember when I said, in some cases, you'd have to replace both the photoreceptors and the RPE. Um, well, some people are working on growing those two cell types together so that they could you know, implant them at the same time. Um, and, and so that's still, that's still in the laboratory phase. So while these results are, are all very exciting, I also like to give a word of caution. Um, 
as a result of all the really exciting work that's going on with stem cells, there has been some overzealous hype about stem cell therapy. Stem cell can mean a lot of different things. Um, and when there's a group of people with an untreatable and serious disease, sometimes there are groups that unfortunately will take advantage of that. Um, as some of you may know, there were a few years ago, many stem cell clinics that popped up offering stem cell clinical trials to patients. Um, so there's, there, are, there are still some actually. Um, and asking patients to pay out of pocket for these expensive treatments. Um, and many of them were using autologous stem cells uh, derived from patient fat samples. Um, and they would do liposuction and then isolate stem cells from the fat samples and then inject them back into the patient. Sometimes intravenously, but sometimes intravitreally, like into the eyeball. Um, and some of these patients had severe vision loss because it just caused a ton of inflammation. And so, um, and so patients had really bad vision loss and some retinal detachments. And so this is a paper publishing an example of that. One of the patients that was treated at one of these clinics, this is um, basically a total retinal detachment in this patient over here. Um, and so <laughs> the FDA has now fortunately increased their oversight of stem cell clinics um, because of what, what happened. Um, and the trial that, the, that this patient participated in from this paper, the trial was actually on clinicaltrials.gov, um, which may make it seem more legitimate, but they had not applied to the FDA for an investigational new drug approval. Um, and so, you know, now, now investigational stem cell use requires an IND application and approval with the FDA. Um, and there has been some legal action against unauthorized stem cell use. Um, so just, you know, to be aware of predatory trials, even those maybe some of those most dangerous trials um, aren't around anymore. There are still trials that, um, you know, they may ask you to pay out of pocket thousands of dollars. Um, and that should be a red flag because that's not usually how clinical trials work. Usually there's a sponsor who's paying for the treatment and there's no cost to the patient. Often the sponsor will even pay for your travel costs. Um, so patients aren't supposed to be paying thousands of dollars to be in clinical trials. Um, if the trial's not registered on clinicaltrials.gov, that's not a good sign. Although apparently even if it is on there, it's not necessarily, you know, that doesn't necessarily give it the, the go ahead. Um, if they don't have an investigational new drug application approval, although as a patient, that would be hard for you to know, but that, that's one question that you might want, maybe would want to ask. Um, and then if all of the preclinical data is on their website without any peer-reviewed publications about, you know, preclinical data, meaning they tested it in, um, in cell culture or animal models, um, what I put an asterisk here because a lot of um, companies, their preclinical data is proprietary. Um, so it won't necessarily be published. But um, what I have seen sometimes is that a, a clinic offering a, an expensive treatment to patients will have a lot of data that's just on their website where they're, they're making claims that haven't been peer reviewed. And so, um, and so that, that should be a red flag. But you know, you can always ask your, your um, retina specialist if you have questions about a specific trial. So in conclusion, patient-derived or gene-edited uh, induced pluripotent stem cells are a powerful, powerful tool to model inherited retinal disease. And stem cell-derived RPE and retinal organoids allow investigation of um, pathologic processes in the human tissue of interest, which is why, why they're so great for disease modeling. Um, such, as, such as protein secretion and chorderemia, which is um, one of the things that I'm studying. These studies will hopefully prepare the way to identify therapeutic targets for drug discovery. If we can identify these pathways that are abnormal, then we have a target that we can, um, that we can go after with small molecule therapy or, or whatever it is. Um, stem cell derived cones and RPE cells are a promising novel therapeutic for a variety of retinal degenerative diseases. And we're, we're, gonna, see, um, we're gonna see clinical trials in the future with this technology. So I wanna acknowledge all of my lab members and my mentors and our leadership at Kellogg and uh, my funding um, from the Choroideremia Research Foundation, the National Eye Institute, 
um, and the Eversight Center for Vision, which um, funded part of this work. So thanks so much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. If there's no questions, um, well, first of all, please make sure to um, either raise your hand, unmute yourself, or put it in the chat. Um, but if there's nothing else, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. All right, going once, going twice. <laughs> that was a lot of information, but um, I, I'm really glad that you're here and had this broad topic. So um, thank you again. And I guess let's go on to our, our resource speakers and I'll hand things off to Tim. Uh, thank you, Allie. Uh, my name is Tim Kaiser and I am the resource chair for the Eastern Michigan chapter. And um, as we've heard and uh, all through this morning, uh, the exciting news about uh, the research that's being done uh, now more so than ever before, um, and the, the possibility of cures, many different types of cures, many different studies for, for foundation uh, for uh, uh, inherited or retinal uh, diseases. But as we wait for that, and as we go forward, we also recognize that uh, people are being diagnosed with inherited retinal diseases on a regular basis, unfortunately. Um, and some of us, like myself, I have X-linked um, RP um, and for many years and um, have needed different resources. And what we want to make sure that as the chapter for Eastern Michigan, that we're also meeting the needs of people um, uh, on a daily basis for uh, resources that they could potentially use and need as we move forward. And so that's one of our goals uh, in the chapter is to talk with ophthalmologists, um, all sorts of eye professionals uh, throughout Southeastern Michigan uh, to make sure they're aware of what the foundation is doing. Um, and also to make sure that newly uh, diagnosed people with retinal diseases have a, um, a, a place to turn to. And so we want to make sure that our resources and the websites and some of the clinical trials and the My Retina Tracker and all the things that we've been talking about this morning um, are available for people um, at various stages in, in their development. So that's sort of the philosophy of what we're doing um, with the resources in the, in the foundation's uh, Eastern Michigan chapter. And to follow through with that, I'd like to introduce our first resource uh, specialist uh, this morning. Her name is Katie Monkovitz, and she joins us from the Washtenaw Library for the Blind and the Physically Disabled. And I would like to, uh, Katie, to invite and welcome you uh, to the, this chapter, the speaker series. And if you could just um, come on and, and tell us a bit about your organization, its mission, and some of the services that you provide. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Tim. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. All right, well, I'm so happy to be here. I'm representing the Washtenaw Library for the Blind and Print Disabled. We did recently change our name from the Library for the Blind and Fifth physically disabled to the print disabled, just to be a little bit more inclusive. Um, just uh, the point is to include folks who also have reading disabilities as well. So we're, um, we, our mission is to provide services so all may read. So we want to include everybody in that, anybody who has a disability that prevents them from reading standard print, whether it be a visual, physical, or reading disability, um, we're here to provide services. Um, our library is part of the National Library for the Blind and Print Disabled, and so services are provided to everybody in the country through the Library of Congress, so it's fully funded through them. So this, these services are free for everybody in the country. Our library specifically serves those in Washtenaw County. Um, 
but we can refer to uh, libraries anywhere. So anybody who needs services, we're able to point them in the right direction. But for those in Washtenaw County, we provide access to large print books um, that can be sent through the mail or gotten at the Ann Arbor District Library branches. Um, anybody in Washtenaw County who is uh, print disabled, visually disabled, qualifies for an Ann Arbor District Library card, as well as anybody who resides in their household as well. We also provide audiobooks, and uh, those can be listened to on uh, talking book players that we also provide. Um, through, those come through the mail, or the way that a lot of our patrons are receiving services now is through the Braille and audio uh, reading download service called BARD. And that can, uh, you can get books on pretty much any device that you have, whether it's a phone, tablet, um, or computer. And so a lot of our patients are really liking that. You don't have to rely um, on the mail service, but some people really still enjoy getting the books through the mail. So we do that. Uh, we also have DVDs that you can get that have um, audio description on them. So uh, without uh, interrupting someone will say something like um tall woman in a red dress just entered the room and so you can get an idea of what's happening on the screen um we also have books in braille and um and so those come from the library in lansing which is our regional library and those all come through the mail as well so it's a mostly mail or digital service at this point and um we our patrons find that to be really convenient you don't have to come into the library although if you do want to come into the library we have an assistive technology lab at our downtown library on south fifth avenue in ann arbor and we have a kurzweil scanner which is has text to speech software on it and so you can scan anything that has print on it and you'll be able to hear what the text is on your document. We also have a, a Windows-based computer that has JAWS uh, screen reading software on it, as well as a Mac computer with a large screen that has all of the Mac accessibility features on it. We have a closed circuit television magnifier that magnifies your print in, um, many different colors, whatever makes it easier for you to see. Um, and then we are actually working on some improvements for our assistive technology lab. We're getting some um, larger keyboards and other things to make it easier to use. So I would encourage anybody who lays eyes on that space downtown to let us know of anything that might make it easier to use. Uh, we're really looking forward to working on improvements in that space. Um, just to let you know like how to go about signing up for this service, you can go to our website at wlbpd.aadl.org. There's an application that you can fill out. Um, it does need a certifying authority signature on it, which is usually um, a physician or somebody who, social worker, um, can even be just a, a person at your assisted living facility who can just sort of say that you have a disability, but actually right now during um, COVID, we've been given the okay to take that information over the phone so you don't necessarily have to go into a doctor's office to get that signed anymore so um, if you're wanting to fill the application out over the phone we're able to do that at this point um, so you can find all of that information on our website you can also give us a call the phone number is 734-327-4224 or email us at wlbpd at aadl.org. Um, I think that I've covered everything. I feel like I was talking really fast, but I'm wondering if 
anybody has any questions or um, anything that I might have gone over too quickly? Katie, I have a question. This is Tim. Yeah. Um, if if you do other counties have similar libraries? So you said for people who live in Washtenaw, like if people are in Oakland or Macomb counties, would there be something similar in those counties? Yes. So not every county has their own specific library. We're we're a little special in that way, but some do. Um, every county is served, though. A lot of them are served by the library in Lansing, which is our regional library. And they just, they serve, I would probably say the majority of folks in our state. Got it. Thanks. Katie, I just actually had a quick question, curiosity based. Um, what's your most popular program or what do you see getting um, the most input in? So <clears throat> I have a couple of answers to that, I guess. The, the most popular thing that we're seeing people sign up for right now is BARD, the Braille and Audio Reading Download Service. It's really, it's an incredible service. Um, I, <clears throat> because, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, because I work for the library, I get the opportunity to use it myself. So I firsthand have been able to see how incredible this service is. There are like tens of thousands com of commercial audiobooks available for download that, you know, other people have to pay for using Audible or other services. And they're just available for free for people uh, who qualify for the service. And so people absolutely love that. And so we're seeing that really rise in popularity, especially as just about everybody has a smart device now and um, it just is really convenient for folks um, who already are comfortable using that these days. So that is definitely something that we're seeing. Uh, but since you mentioned programming, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, push a program that we find is always really popular at the library and that's our Visions Vendor Fair. So we have, um, it's usually in May, the last couple of years have been a little weird. We didn't have it last year. And then the year before we did it uh, virtually. Uh, this year, we're hoping to bring it back again um, in person. Um, so we're just kind of like juggling with when it's going to be and how we're going to pull that off um, safely. But stay tuned for Visions Vendor Fair at the library coming back. We usually have like 30 or so vendors related to visual and physical disability and um, speakers throughout the day, as well as like uh, fun socializing times and food and stuff. So um, stay tuned for Visions 2022. We'll have information on that up on our website as soon as we figure everything out. Awesome, thank you. Did you see uh, Gail's question? Um, she asked, do you offer in-surface style webinars on local or state resources? And I mean, just on the foundation side, this is exactly why we're so glad to have everyone, each presenter is, you know, we, we want to make sure that, um, that you're aware of local resources, but um, in terms of the, the library, please share. Yeah, so we don't really... We haven't done any any sort of thing like that before. I'm thinking that might be something that the Braille and Talking Book Library in Lansing might maybe do or would have uh, more of that style sort of resources available. There's also um, other training places. Like I know there's a training facility in Kalamazoo that might do something like that. Um, we don't, although I would definitely encourage you to check out our speakers at Visions. And um, because you mentioned webinars, I think that we are going forward, always going to be um, offering our, our talks um, online as well as in person. I think that's something that we'll just like continue doing now that we've done it and we know we can do it and we know people like it. And that's, you know, it's really 
convenient for folks. Um, I see another question. The library's website address is wlbpd.aadl.org. So it's a lot of random letters, I know, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> also, um, I'm, as I mentioned, going to be sending the recording. I will also include that sort of information. So I'll include that, that website URL in case uh, anyone was not able to catch that. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Katie? All right, well, thank you so much. We're gonna switch gears for a second um, by going to our revenue chair, uh, Sue. Hi, everybody. Um, just really quick before I get into the bowling thing, I'll just introduce myself a little bit. Um, my name is Sue Chapel, and I am the revenue chair for the Eastern Michigan chapter. Um, super excited to be a part of this. Um, just a little quick insight as to how I got involved in things. Um, my daughter was diagnosed with RP when she was 19 and she is now 27. So um, in the beginning, like everybody else, a lot of frustration, a lot of, um, you know, things that we were um, very, you know, unfamiliar with. Um, but um, as time went on, we just decided just to try to dive in and, and do everything we could to get a little bit more educated and also get involved as, as much as possible. So for us, um, we really got involved in the vision walk and with that, um, a lot of fundraising. So um, when I came about the Eastern chapter and the things that were needed there, the revenue um, chair part of it kind of just came home to me because um, we have done a lot of fundraising um, along the past years. We have done the vision walk for many years. Um, so um, each year before the vision walk, we try to do um, either one really big fundraiser or a few small ones. We've done many different kind, but um, what we have found that has brought in um, the most fundraising dollars um, are the bowling fundraisers. So with that being said, um, we are going to have a bowling fundraiser on March 6th. Um, it is a Sunday and it is going to be held at uh, Premier Bowling Lanes. It is in Chesterfield, Michigan. And I apologize if that's far for some people. Um, I did, I called around, I tried to find, um, you know, um, as many bowling alleys that I could that um, had options and, um, you know, availability and kind of looked at, um, you know, what the, what the amounts were that they were charging that type of thing. So um, I myself have had a bowling fundraiser at this bowling alley before, and they're really awesome. They're really helpful. Um, so the reason we like to have the bowling fundraisers um, more than other types of fundraisers, not that others aren't good, but um, the bowling fundraiser just enables us to do a lot of other things at the bowling alley. Um, which also helps, you know, bring in some of that revenue. Um, so um, again, like I said, it's going to be at Premier Lanes. Um, we, we will have more information um, as we start to get a little bit closer and able to kind of focus more on this. I am going to prepare a flyer so that we can all share it with as many people as possible. Um, the address, just to throw it out there, is 33151 23 Mile Road. And again, that's in Chesterfield. Um, it is just east of I-94, so um, anybody traveling from other distances, it is just a nice um, shot off, off 94. Um, it is going to be $20 per person, and that is going to include uh, two games of bowling. It'll include shoes. It includes pizza and pop. And um, like I previously said, we like to incorporate other things at the bowling alley um, to help, you know, raise some money. So, um, of course, the, you know, the, the people coming in and paying for, you know, the bowling and, and whatnot obviously goes towards that. 
but we also have, um, we usually have done basket raffles, which are a big hit. So um, I myself prepare some, we get people to donate, make up different types of baskets. I'm sure everybody have seen these before, movie baskets, lottery baskets, stack baskets, uh, you know, beach baskets, whatever anybody wants to come up with. Um, they're a huge hit. Everybody buys lottery, you know, little tickets, raffle tickets. We have little bags in front of them. They stick them in there. We raffle them off. Um, we also always have, um, we try to do one or two 50-50 raffles during the, during the fundraiser, um, which also helps raise money. Um, we have had bake sales at the bowling fundraisers before, which believe it or not, were really big hits. Um, obviously, everything is wrapped, you know, um, People, um, you know, buy, love, buy everything from cookies to brownies to cakes to, you know, whatever we can get people to donate and help participate in. Um, and then we have also had in the past, we've had some silent auctions at the bowling alley um, fundraisers. Um, and we also have had, I have had um, people who have donated larger items, you know, more expensive items. So sometimes we have just a, um, a separate raffle. Um, you know, we've had some Bose sound system type things before. We've had a TV. We've had, um, you know, the big, uh, you know, thing full of alcohol, that type of stuff. So um, when we have something larger like that, sometimes we do like a separate um, uh, raffle where the ticket might cost, you know, um, maybe $10 per, per raffle ticket. And then we raffle that off. So um, obviously we're up to anybody that has any, um, you know, um, anything, any, uh, any other recommend, recommendations. Um, but like I said, um, again, this is gonna be on March 6th, super excited about it. It gives us enough time to um, kind of prepare for it. Um, in the past, you know, we've always tried to really um, choose our dates wisely, um, trying to kind of steer clear of um, holidays, that type of thing, so that we can get as many people there as possible. So. Um, Look, really looking forward to it. Again, our team will um, work a little bit more closely on this to get people to participate and help out. Um, you know, everybody, if you could please spread the word. Um, you know, obviously we need as many people there as possible. It's a really fun time um, for kids and adults both. Um, so um, I think I covered ev everything there. If anybody has any questions, but like I said, our team will work a little bit closer, closer, um, you know, moving forward after this and get everything kind of more solidified. And I will prepare, um, I'm in the midst of it right now, but I wanted to kind of wait um, to kind of make sure we, you know, we have everything in place as far as what we're going to be doing there. Um, I will prepare a flyer that we can share with everybody as well. Thank you, Sue. Um, I hope everyone on the call can uh, attend that. And um, with all that said, uh, Tim, would you mind introducing our, our last speaker? Sure, of course, thank you. So um, um, our second resource speaker for uh, this morning's uh, uh, chapter meeting uh, also comes to us from Ann Arbor uh, and it's William Purves. And he is um, part of the Center for Independent Living in Ann Arbor. And William, I'd like to welcome you to our, our chapter speaker series. And please tell us a little bit about yourself and your organization and sort of the mission that, uh, that you have there at the Center for Independent Living. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for having me. I've been having um, internet connectivity problems here in Ann Arbor. We've had really heavy winds and it's been flickering the power, which causes the router to drop off. So you may hopefully not lose me. Um, and if I, if I rush a little bit, it's partly because I'm anxious about being disconnected. <laughs> so the, the Center for Independent Living uh, is a disability advocacy and service organization. Um, we are one of 13 across the state of Michigan. Um, others go by the names Disability Network um, or um, SAIL in the Northern, uh, in the UP. Uh, and they are also found in other states, all other states across the country. We receive federal and state funding to provide <laughs> a wide range of services to uh, anyone with a disability of any age at no cost. Uh, 
and we have a staff. Our geographic range is Livingston, Washtenaw, and Monroe County. So even though we're in Ann Arbor, that's our range. We have satellite offices in the other counties. And we have a staff of about 35 people. Uh, we provide um, benefits counseling uh, for uh, all ages and sort of navigating uh, the benefits landscape for people with disabilities. Um, we provide uh, a lot of, uh, we can provide guidance on guardianship, especially for parents of, of children who are approaching the 18 or uh, 26 year old uh, age band um, with a disability sort of navigating that landscape. Uh, we do a wide variety of advocacy work uh, at all levels of government, including the state and federal levels. Um, we do a big part of what we work on is employment uh, support and transition support. So to working with people with disabilities to enable them to live as independently a life as they envision and are um, able um, to achieve. So we work, do a ton of work with youth in schools on employment skills. We also work with a lot of adults helping folks um, start and maintain businesses, uh, maintain employment uh, and so forth. We also work uh, with uh, people who are in nursing facilities who wish to leave and find we locate housing, uh, help them get set up with services and other kinds of accessibility features that they might need uh, in a house or apartment um, to allow them to live um, independently. Um, also, a, another sort of big chunk of what we do is recreation and services, so classes um, and uh, other activities designed to address issues of social isolation among people with disabilities. So support, we sponsor support groups. Um, and uh, like I said, art classes, uh, recreational events, uh, cycling, we have a gym in Ann Arbor. Um, and we work, do a lot of outreach programs um, in all three counties. Then the final sort of big area that we work on is consulting on accessibility issues and um, ADA issues. And that's a big part of my job is working on um, uh, architecture, uh, um, automotive projects. I've done a lot of work recently on autonomous vehicle design and um, accessibility in that, in that space. And then also on uh, apps and electronic products. We've also, as part of that, do a lot of disability education and um, disability awareness. We present programs in schools and to um, do run workshops and training programs with businesses, um, institutions, um, other organizations uh, to raise awareness of uh, issues of accessibility, issues of inclusion and diversity, and the ways in which people with disabilities um, can be an asset uh, to an organization. Um, in terms of my role, besides the consulting, I do a lot of uh, work on building collaborative relationships with other institutions and with other um, organizations. I manage a lot of grants. I write a lot of grants. And um, then what else do I do? I do a lot of different things. <laughs> I have a team of about eight people. We coordinate, uh, they coordinate advocacy efforts. Um, we, have our, we have a pretty large uh, assistive technology initiative, uh, especially during COVID, which was really ramped up. We uh, gave away and trained people to use, uh, we gave away over 300 um, uh, tablets and uh, large uh, print keyboards um, in order to facilitate access uh, to telehealth and address social isolation issues. Um, and then I guess finally, I, I have um, RP. And uh, so that's my 
I guess one of the connections I have with the uh, Foundation Fighting Blindness as well. And Dr. Fahim is my, uh, I have the privilege of working with her as she's my doctor. So any questions? Uh, William, this is Tim and I just wonder, um, I uh, did my graduate work in Ann Arbor. Uh, I was in the 90s, late 90s. But I, I was the first time I went to a support group with other blind folks, because I have RP as well. And it was at the Center for Independent Living. And um, just, I have to admit, it was one of the, for me, it was a big step to sit down and talk with other folks who were blind and getting to know what it was like. Um, and I just wondered, do you still have things like those support groups um, at, at the Center? Absolutely. Yeah, we I, right now we're in, I don't think I, we don't have one uh, for people with uh, low vision or blindness. We do have uh, an MS uh, support group. We have um, an autism um, support group. We have a uh, sort of social meetup as well for um, adults, um, autistic adults. Uh, we have uh, a deaf and hard of hearing um, support group that also coordinates with us. It's been difficult with COVID because we've had to, we shifted everything to virtual. Um, and so we're just starting to have in-person um, events again this fall. So it's sort of choosing how and when to kind of ramp those up and balancing those against um, the health needs and concerns of our constituents. Oh, and we also do, we have a, a spinal injury support group as well. Any other questions? Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, William, I did not know that you and Dr. Fahim had that connection. That's yeah. um, funny. quite a small world. But um, we're obviously going to be ending a little early uh, today, which is, I would prefer that rather than having to cut speakers off. But um, I really want to, if anyone has any questions just for any of the speakers or just to you know share your story or just anything, um, one thing I will mention is that we are having, we will have these sort of speaker series uh, quarterly. Um, and I'd love your, your feedback and um, just, yeah, really any questions, any feedback, any just comments. Um, but if not, we'll, we'll end a, a bit early today. All right. Well, like I said, I am going to be sending out the recording. Um, William, is should I provide maybe your your website? Is that the best way to maybe? I, I know I'm going to be providing that um, with the one Katie said for. Um, I need to remember the new name. Uh, Library for the Blind and Print Disabled. Um, is there a, a link you'd like yeah, me to share? Yeah, we have. It's. Um... Ann Arbor CIL .org. Okay. okay, I'll be sure to include that um, in the email that I sent to everyone, not just attendees, but anyone who registered. Um, but I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. And um, if anyone has any questions that, you know, right as you end the call, you, you think of it, uh, please reach out. Um, we'll make sure those get answered. But thank you again, everyone, so much, speakers, attendees, uh, our leadership. Uh, really appreciate you all. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Allie. God bless you.